Clap your hands, O ye people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Oh, come on and lift your voice while you clap your hands. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory be to God. As you remain standing with me, please, in honor to the word of the Lord, we are in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 23. It is good to be here with you. We have been anticipating this. Amen. What God is getting ready to do in this place. There are times when the Lord designates that he is going to explode in a place. It is because he has preordained a plan. The plan is God. And tonight there is an explosive nature of God that is present. It is because the Spirit of the Lord has come ready to perform in accordance to what we will allow. One of the things that the Lord is going to help us with is to become flexible. We get very rigid with God. We have a saying, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. And we need for God to help us to be flexible. Amen. Chapter 2 of the book of Acts. I realize for some of you, you may not be used to some of these things that may transpire. But the Lord, amen, moves as he determines. We're going to read from verse 23 down through to verse 28. And I'm going to ask that you would read out loud with me, please. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy. Before you're seated, amen, this isn't my subject, but just before you're seated, would you repeat this after me? Just say, this is the place where the word of God is preached. Jesus is glorified. The saints are edified. And the devil is horrified. We're getting ready to glorify Jesus, edify the saints, and horrify the devil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you as you are seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you. I have to say thanks to Sister Cobbs, who's worked so diligent in putting this all together, calling me and, and uh, touching bases back and forth. And we thank God very much for her. For, for Pastor, we have so just enjoyed such sweet, sweet fellowship. And it's like we've known each other for years. And God is the only one that can do those kinds of things. I want you to pay attention with me as we're getting ready to get into the word of the Lord to verse 23. Where it says, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And then if you look, it says in verse 24 that it was impossible. It was not possible that he should be held. The Bible goes on down into verse 27, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. And I want to preach to you or speak to you tonight on this subject, I'm not staying here. I'm not staying here. There are certain deliverances that do not take place until you also make up in your mind to agree with God that you're not staying there. You're not staying there. The Bible said, woe to those who are at ease in Zion. What happens to us is we become comfortable. 
we get to the place, amen, where we learn to grin and bear it, live with whatever our infirmity, trouble, or trial is. And what happens is after a while, we become so comfortable in the situation that we actually can be afraid to be removed out of the situation. Because to come out of the situation brings me into an unknown. At least if I'm in the situation, I know what to expect and that I can deal with. Don't take me into the unknown that scares me, that makes me afraid. And so God is saying, if you want deliverance, you're going to have to move into the unknown. Now, Peter, if you want to walk with me, you've got to get out of the boat. I'm not, I'm not walking in the boat. You, you're going to have to get out of the boat. Leave your life preserver and walk. Step out where everybody else is not going. Now, I, we're going to enter into some concepts in scriptures. And I pray that you will follow me along in this scriptural journey as we begin to break down the word of the Lord. I'm in Ephesians chapter 1 right now. Ephesians chapter 1 because there's some things biblically we need to understand in order to walk effectively with God now let me just say this we have a saying up our way if you don't pray you can't stay and see many people want all these things from God but very few want to come to prayer very few want to come to prayer you cannot, because you are apostolic and have a doctrine, expect God to show up. I challenge anybody biblically on that. He doesn't show up for Acts 2.38. The Bible says what makes God show up is Matthews 5 and 6. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When hunger is demonstrated, when people come hungry, wanting to spend time with God, that is when God manifests himself. He doesn't come because you have an outward standard. He doesn't come because you have a doctrine. He comes because you're hungry. I wonder if somebody in here hungry. Is somebody in here hungry? You cannot be hungry and then not spend time with God. You cannot be hungry and not come to prayer. I want to challenge some of you because the Lord, I was, I was around here praying. I came around 4.30 and just began to pray. I want to challenge some of you to come. Come for prayer. If, you, if there's some of you in here tonight, you have specific needs you're wanting God to do. Come for prayer. Come during the time of prayer. Some of you discover before even the service begins, God will have met you. Because you're not coming to meet with me as an evangelist. You're coming to meet with God. But what happens to many of you is that you are having difficulty because the only time you start to praise or start to pray is when you come to church. You cannot expect God to show up in that. He will not. When I listen to places like Uganda and different things, one of the hallmarks that, that sets these places off from us is their hunger. I want to tell you why these places are receiving miracles. These folks will come and stand for six hours. They won't see what happens to us is we pray two and three minutes and we're done. They will pray hours, praising and worshiping God for hours until clothes are drenched. People start getting filled with the Holy Ghost like this. Nobody's got to lay hands on them. Nobody's got to take them through some tiring process. When the presence of God comes, whatever God is shows up with his presence. God is the Holy Ghost. Therefore, when he comes, the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. So when people begin to praise, God comes. He is, the Bible said, deep calleth unto deep. God comes calls and when you start calling by praise God responds by a deepness now we've got to gain an understanding there is a distinction between an applause and a praise now for those of you that want to know the distinction it's Psalms 47 verse 1 the Bible said, clap your hands, O ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It didn't just say clap your hands. Clapping your hands is an applause. 
That's one thing if you're clapping your hands doing the word. But when you start entering into praise, the Bible says you must clap your hands, shout. The reason is David instituted this as a form of worship, praise. Because according to 2 Kings chapter 11, when the people approached the king and enthroned him, they would clap their hands and shout, oh God, save the king. Now David said, now wait a minute, if you can do this for an earthly monarchy, how much more should you do for heavenly? Somebody clap your hands and open up your mouth and shout unto God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory. Oh, he doesn't want just an applause. He wants praise. Glory, 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 glory! Hallelujah, hallelujah! Thank you! Praise be to God, praise be to God. He is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy! Hallelujah. He is worthy. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 now and let us get into more of the word of the Lord. There are some things that we must digest by the Spirit. The Lord is come to this place to do mass healing. But God, as I walked around this place, the Lord began to confirm and reconfirm into my spirit again as he gave me a theme for this revival. It is restructuring or reconstructing godly identity. God has come to reconstruct godly identity. For many of you who have had your identity damaged through the courses of events, over the courses of years, through words, through deeds, through insecurities, through fears, through depressions. It never ceases to amaze me with apostolics. What's happened to us is we played ring around the rosy, around a doctrine. I never, never found relationship. You say, are you downgrading the doctrine? No, no, no. Listen to Paul, Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving behind. We don't want to do that. Leave behind the principles of the doctrine. See, we don't want to do that. We're afraid to compromise. So we, we think if we do that, we're compromising. He said, but if you don't leave the principles, you cannot move on to perfection. When are we going to understand that Acts 2.38 is a birth certificate? That's what it is. It's a birth certificate. It's a beginning. It's not an end. And we have stopped there. Consequently, many of our apostolics dwell in this. May I put it to you this way? Rules or rituals without relationship results in rebellion. So we have people that follow the rules, go through the rituals, have no relationship. And you can tell it when it comes time to talk to God, when it comes time to praise God. Sometimes the people of God are funny. <laughs> it's sometimes amazing to watch the people of God. They'll clap their hands and sing songs like, we are happy people, yes we are. And then, and, and, you know, <laughs> if, you know, if you're happy, you have to notify your face. You can't, you, you can't be happy and look like you're in pain. You can't sell something to somebody else. And you look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. It, it just doesn't work. And so God's bringing forth relationship. Relationship. Chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, let's start at verse 4, and let's get into the mind of God. I'm not concerned with another sermon. We've, had a, we've heard enough messages. We need the mind of God. The Bible says, according as he has chosen us in him before the what? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us. Predestined means he predetermined or he decided before. Before your mother ever knew your father, before your grandparents ever came together, before your great-great-grandparents ever moved into this country or relocated, God had decided before, before there was a Pentecost, before there was a law, before there was an Abraham, before there was even an Adam, God had decided before. He did not wait for you to get filled with the Holy Ghost to decide what to do with you. Everybody say before. Yeah, this was decided. See, a lot of you are struggling because you're wondering what does God want? This thing was decided before. 
It was not waited till you started speaking in an some unknown language and then God goes, oh God, now what do I do with them? God says, uh, no, I have already decided that. That was decided before you had my spirit. You were predestined, predetermined. Some of you right now are in hell. You are in a living hell because your destiny took you there. It's because God predetermined that in order for you to receive what I want you to have, you've got to walk through this valley before your head can get anointed with oil. The Bible says a good man's steps are ordered. They are not haphazard. Some of you think you're acting like you fell into a problem. Listen, God knew you were going to go there. God knew you were going to get hurt. God knew you were going to bleed. God knew you were going to scratch your head and say, my God, my God, why? God already knew. He, he's not caught off God. He's foreknowledge. It's part of what makes him God. Nobody else possesses it. The devil doesn't possess it. Gabriel doesn't have it. Michael doesn't have it. He stands up by himself and says, I have the counsel. He already knew every mistake you'd make. Watch God. Watch God. Because this is where a lot of you are struggling. You can't forgive yourself. Because you've made some terrible mistakes. But wait a minute. Stop. He filled you with the Spirit knowing before what mistakes you would make. That means he had to administer forgiveness to give you his Spirit. So if he decided in a vote of confidence to give you his Spirit with the foreknowledge of all the mistakes you'd make, then who are you not to forgive yourself? Before. Everybody say before. before. All right. Now let's go on just a little bit more. Now notice in verse 5, you predestined on the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Verse 11, and whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own own will he did not do this just so an organization could live God is not an organization he is an organism this is a body movement not an organizational movement and when you start limiting it to an organizational movement you have already missed the mind of God the Apostle Paul said this thing was not done in the corner it's not done with an organization. I respect the UPC, love the UPC, but it's not done by the UPC. Respect the PAW, love the but it's not done by the PAW. It's not done by Church of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are over 300 different apostolic organizations in the world. This is a body movement. Body movement. One head baptized into one body by one spirit. Now that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, what I want to get across to you, I'm not going to take time to dissect all of these particular scriptures in Ephesians, because what I want to get across to you is that God has already decided where you were walking. Now that doesn't mean he made you walk there. That means he already knew that the devil was going to try to destroy you. Now the reason why the devil wants to destroy you is because of what God put inside of you. We call it destiny. Destiny means that God has put in you a desired end. That at the end, this is what you ought to be. The devil looks at that and goes, now wait a minute. If I let you become what God just designed you to be, that means you will have to destroy me in the process. So the devil says, now why should I be stupid and wait for you to grow up and destiny get released out of you and you destroy my kingdom? 
I'll destroy you in the crib. I will start from your childhood and riddle you with low self-esteem. So when it comes time to release this destiny, you are afraid. You won't release what God put inside of you. You feel insecure. You feel unable. You feel inadequate. You look around and you see yourself. God calls you to be a singer. And you look around and you see yourself as inadequate. Me sing? Well, they tune an engine by my voice. Me sing? You know, me sing? Instead of calling me Amy, Amy Grant, they call me Amy Grunt. Me sing? See, and the devil's got you making all of these jokes about destiny. Now, what you're saying to yourself, now wait a minute, if I'm destined to be so great, why am I in such a mess? <laughs> now, now, those of you that can float through walls and those of you that float around and never touch the earth, I'm not touching, I'm not talking to you. Just put your finger in your ears, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to human beings that have to walk on God's earth. Why am I in such a mess if I was ordained by God to conquer? How many believe that Jesus is the Almighty God? He's not Jehovah Junior. He's the fullness of the Godhead. Now the Bible said the servant is no greater than his Lord. Now, so if the Lord had to go into hell, if the Lord had to become a bloody mess on a cross, then guess what's going to happen to you? Then why are you so amazed that all of a sudden it seems like your life had turned upside down? Why are you so amazed that all of a sudden it feels like you've been crucified? Why are you amazed that you feel like you've been buried and cannot see the light of the day and cannot feel the glorious light of God's presence? In order for you to be who God destined you to be, you must walk through the valley of the shadow of death in order to have your head anointed with oil. Your destiny will take you into hell. It will take you into places that you thought you would never go. It will put you into positions that you thought you would never have to handle. You thought you could pray it away. Well, if I just pray enough, this will never happen to me. If I just cry out to God enough, nothing like this would ever go wrong in my life. My, ch my child will never get sick. I'll never lose a loved one because all I have to do is keep crying. You didn't recognize. Destiny says in order for you to be who you're called to be, you must go into this fire. Check out Isaiah chapter 48 verse 10. Take a look at it. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 10. Take a look at it. You need to see some things by scripture because some of you are struggling in yourself and you don't recognize the master plan of God by his foreknowledge, his predetermined counsel. Some of the hardest times in our lives is when we're teenagers. Teenagers, emotional swings, either you hate it or you love it. Trying to find identity, trying to find acceptance, wanting to be liked, don't like hardly anything about yourself. My ears too big, my nose too wide, my lips too. Don't like anything about yourself. We call it the Barbie doll syndrome. And you're always in search for Ken. You want me to leave that alone, don't you? So your image of who you're supposed to be is being determined by, not by God, but by an advertisement agency. And you're struggling, wondering why am I in this quandary? Why am I fighting like this? And God allows you to go through this time of vacillation. He watches you while you try to fit into cliques, even within the church, trying to fit into acceptance. You go through times where you're lifting your hands and praising the Lord, and you're looking out of the corner of your eye to see if the rest of your friends are praising God or not. If they get emotional, you'll get emotional. If they get, like, subdued, you can, yeah, I'll, I'll stay subdued. 
and you have to go through those transitions and in your own head there is such a fury of questions that you cannot seem to answer Isaiah chapter 48 verse 10 now look what he says in Isaiah 48 and 10 he says I have chosen you in the furnace of of you're not chosen by how much you can just jump and shout and praise and, and thank God during revival meetings. You are chosen by how you act in fire. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, ask them, what do you do when the fire hits? Yeah, what do you do when the fire hits? What do you do when the fire hits? Uh, so what happens is God said, now I've got to release your destiny by putting you into fire. If you want the gold to be purified and be worth something, it must go into fire. 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 We have got to get out of our heads this crossless Christianity. Somehow apostolics have devised this notion we are never supposed to suffer. Nothing's ever supposed to go wrong with us. We're never have, supposed to have anything that makes us cry. Nothing's supposed to happen to our kids. Nothing's supposed to happen to our church. Nothing's supposed to happen to our pastor. Nothing's supposed to happen to anywhere. God said, now if you want destiny to come out of you, what I put in you, you're going to have to walk through some fires. Now listen to the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. Take a look at it. 1 Peter chapter 4. Listen to what the Apostle Peter said. Because you need to see that the foreknowledge of God took Jesus into hell. But there was also a promise waiting. Your destiny will take you to hell, but your destiny won't leave you there. Well, I don't know what makes you shout, brother, but excuse me. Woo! <laughs> when you've been in there long enough, honey, you are ready to get out, and it's good to know you got a promise that'll let you out. <laughs> now, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, deals with the fact that he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He said, now arm yourself likewise with the same he said, now look, you've got to get in your head that you're going to suffer. <laughs> it's okay, I wasn't expecting excitement. Really, I really wasn't. He said, no, look, you've got to get in your head that you're going to have some fires. You've you got to get in your mind there's going to be some trials. Some of you are depressed because you just think you ought not to be going through anything. My grandkids should not be born with a heart murmur. It, this, this just isn't right. And, and so now you're wondering what's wrong with God and what's wrong with your relationship and why is this happening? But destiny ought to be determined that you've got to walk a certain pathway. Now look at verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, think it not strange. Did you notice what he called you? Be loved. Because a lot of you, as soon as you hit fire, God don't love me. No, be loved. You are the object of God's love. Think it not strange, odd, peculiar, concerning the fiery trials which are to try you, as though some strange thing happened. Why are you acting like you're so strange because your tire's flat? Why are you acting like it's strange because your car won't start? Why are you acting like it's strange because folk are telling you off on your job? Why are you acting like it's strange because you just burnt your food? You know, I have had to learn some lessons from the Lord. And so God is training us that we are not governed by situations. We are governed by the foreknowledge, predestined destiny of God. Now listen to what he said in Micah 7 and 8. Read out loud with me. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy, when I... Now notice what it says. It didn't say, if I fall. It said, when. Now see, we're not the only one that does rejoicing. The enemy will try to rejoice when he watches you fall. When I fall. Now look what he says. 
I shall what? <laughs> See, destiny allowed me to fall into hell, allowed me to be taken into hell. But watch out, destiny caused me to resurrect. I shall rise. And when I sit in darkness, that means I don't have understanding, I'm confused. The Lord shall become my light. And what God is telling this church in Cincinnati is you have destiny. And the reason why you have been going through some of the stuff you've been going through, the reason why you have suffered the hurts and the pains and the disappointments and the discouragement and the lack of understanding and the church splits and people accusing and people saying this and people say it is because God said you've got to walk through that hell. But if you will go through that hell and rejoice, you shall arise. Out of the ashes you shall arise. Out of the struggle you shall arise. Out of the pain you shall arise. Now listen, you gotta understand the concept. You cannot have power without having pain. Everybody wants power without pain. You cannot, amen, have a crown without a cross. And so what God is saying, I allow this church. What do you mean, son? What do you mean? God knew what the devil was going to do exactly. Exactly. You mean to tell me that God knew that people were going to rise up and speak out against you? You mean to tell me God knew, amen, that people were going to get angry and mad at each other and separate and part company? Yeah, uh-huh. You mean to, and you know what? God said destiny is at work. What are you saying? I'm saying that God said through the fire, I will make known who are the wheat and who are the tares. Watch this. Watch this. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Now, I don't know what your concept is, what you've heard about baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptism of fire. I hear people talking about, I was baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's, that's nice, but you know what I discover? Very few have ever been baptized with fire, ever. Because I want to show you what the fire does. Jesus starts talking. I said, now listen, I'm not going to quote this one verbatim. I want to break it down. He said, listen, I'm going to separate the wheat from the chaff. And then I'm going to take the chaff, verse 12, and I'm going to burn it up with unquenchable. Verse 11, he deals with the fact that, no, wait a minute, there's one that's coming after me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with. Mm -hmm. Then he tells what the fire is going to do. It, the fire is meant to burn up your chaff. It's not to make you shout. It's not to make you rejoice. It's to burn up your flesh. Very few have ever been baptized with fire, brother. Very few, very few have ever been baptized with fire. See, if you, when you want to be great and you want God to take you through your process of being made into destiny, you're going to have to be burned with some fire. People are going to burn you. Now, you know what we've learned? We're really smart, you know. We're not dumb creatures. We're made in the image of God. We catch on real quick. Burn me once, buddy, but not twice. So then we go from lifting our hands to God doing this to doing this to everybody. Keep your distance. <laughs> Love ya. Stay over there. <laughs> Destiny took you into those things. See, Acts chapter 2 says it was not possible that the pains of death should hold him. If you understand this, friend, and you are right now sitting in a hell, you don't know what you're going to do. You cannot seem to get through your head which way to go or what to do. I want you to keep this into your spirit. It is impossible. Now watch this. It's not impossible for death. The pains of death. See, a lot of you have come through things, but you still have the pain. It's impossible for the pains of death to hold you. You can be loose not just from the experience, but loose from the pain. 
Destiny took you there to make you. Destiny took you there to forge you. Destiny took you there, amen, to bring you to a place of understanding that you were going to have to walk through this valley so that God could begin to empower you. Now, what was meant to destroy you? That's why the Bible said when Jesus got up, he got up with all power. How did you get up with all power? Because I laid in a tomb for three days buried. How did you get up with all power because everybody forsook me? How did you get up with all power because I've got nail prints in my hands and my feet? How did you get up with all power? It's because I had a crown of thorn in my head. How did you get up with all power? It's because I cried, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken? It is when you have cried somewhere, somewhere in the darkness of the depth of your own soul. It is when you stained your own pillow and it said, my tears have been my meat day and night. While they said unto me continually, where is your God? If God God is so much with you, why are you suffering? If God is so much with you, why is your child sick? If God is so much with you, why are you in debt? And while you're saying, my God, my God, why? God is saying, I brought you here because you're going to learn about me. You're going to get a revelation in the situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we have a little thing in church called testimony services. The first word to testimony is test. Now when you develop more than a testimony, which is one, into testimonies, you move from tests that cause moanings. Some of you got it. <laughs> you move into tests that cause you moanings. And so you have testimonies. Listen to what God says. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the Word. Ooh. I thought that thing was supposed to destroy me. No, no, no. It makes you armed and dangerous. Lethal. Because now I don't have to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, honey. Let me tell you about my own fire. I don't have to talk about dying on a lion's den. Let me tell you when I walked into my lion's den and people were roaring and yelling and God shut their mouth. I have a testimony. He can bring me out. He can make a way out of no way. And the reason why he can make a way out of no way is because Jesus said, I am the way. Now the Bible says in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Not agree, agreed. Past tense. You must agree first, walk later. That's why some of you are struggling. You're trying to agree with God while you walk doesn't work. Agree first, walk later. That's why sometimes you got to sit down someplace in some valley of decision and you can't move anymore war, until you make up in your mind that God is right. Then you're empowered to get up and walk. Now, the understanding here is this, friend. God wants to walk you out of your valley. He wants to walk you. The Bible says that Jesus has keys of death and hell. Can you, sometimes, sometimes when I'm in prayer and things are struggling, I can hear in the spirit keys banging up against the side of his thigh. While the Bible said he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. He has the keys to open up the jail cell of your hell. He knows how to let you out. But you've got to agree with God. You're not staying here. You might have been depressed. You might have been battling fear. You may have been battling anxiety. But you've got to make up in your mind that I will not leave my soul in hell. God is not going to leave me. I am not staying here. It can't rain all the time, honey. It's got to be sunshine sometime. The Bible said weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. There is a morning. I said there is a morning. They that sow in tears shall, they shall reap in joy. They shall reap in joy. 
This is why God said, I want you to understand that if you have been crying, you have been saturating your pillow, you have been wondering where is God, you have been asking questions, coming up for the altar, receiving prayer after prayer, doing everything everybody told you to do, trying to pray, trying to worship, trying to read your Bible, and yet there is no relief in sight. There's two things, friend, I want you to understand. Number one, your destiny eight. You are being groomed for greatness. And depending on what you have been predetermined to be, that's how long your grooming process is going to take. If you are meant to be a private in God's army, you go through three months in boot camp. But hey, if you're called to be a general, you better look at 30 years. Hey, general. The longer the training, the greater the call. That's why the songwriter said, don't wait for the battle to be over. Learn to shout right now. Anybody can shout when the battle is over. I don't take no faith. But when you're in the midst of the fire, and you can say, though you slay me, yeah. After all that I've been through, I still have my joy. I still have my peace. I still have my integrity. I still have my praise. You cannot make me doubt him. I know too much about him. Woo! God said, I need people in here tonight to make up in their mind that I'm not staying here. I might be right now, amen. God said, I will not leave your soul in hell. I will not leave you in a place of corruption. I will come myself and deliver you. The Bible said that he that shall come will come and will not tarry. But until then, the scripture says, now the just shall live by faith. I don't feel God. I don't see God. I don't know what God is doing. I don't know. Maybe y'all never had this. Have you ever come, amen, before God? You pray for other people, and they go, man, you can pray. Every time you pray for me, I get my prayers. The prayer gets right answered. And you turn your face to God and say, it's not that I'm not rejoicing. Thank you that you heard me when I prayed for them. But when are you going to hear me when I'm praying for me? When are you when are you going to move? When are you going to move when, on what I'm asking you? I've been asking you for such a long time, and it seems like the heat of the day is just beating me down into a pulp, and I appear to be in desert places. I lay hands on folk, and they talk about feeling the presence of God, and the goose pumps in their hair goes back on the back of their neck, and woo, they get all shouty and dancing, and I stand there like my soul is a Sahara desert. That's when you're made to walk by faith. That's when God said, trust me, where you can't trace me and love me when you don't understand me. That becomes a mark of maturity. When you can look in the face of your enemy and tell the enemy, God said he won't leave my soul here. I'm not staying here. I'm just like David. I shall not die, but I'm going to live and declare the works of the Lord. Somebody say, I shall not die, but live, but live, but live and declare the works of God. I shall not die. Some of you, you've already laid down in your situations. You've already given up the fight. You've already said, I've tried for so long and here I lay. What more can I do? You said, I'm dead on the inside. And yet it appears the people of God don't even recognize it. 
It's as if nobody even knows what's going on with me. And you know sometimes what is even so hurtful, it's as if the world picks up easier on it. My people on my, my job ask me, are you okay? Well, people on the, in, in the church don't seem to care at all. You say, hey, I want you to know the scripture for that. The Bible says when it came to Jesus, Pilate wanted to let him go. It was the world that wanted to let Jesus go. It was the modern day church that said crucify him. And sometimes you'll find more sympathy friend in the world. Your co-workers, people that don't talk in tongues, people that aren't baptized in, your na in the name of Jesus. They want to help let you go. Well, when you turn to people in the church, it's like they're indifferent. They, they, it's like as if, what's wrong with you? You have a problem? And a lot of you are getting mad at people because you're like, now wait a minute. When you were at this altar, my hand was on your back. And I prayed with you. I cried with you. And I helped pray you through. Now I'm at this altar. And you look at me like, why are you there? Hey, when you need encouragement, I was on the phone with you. Saying, come on, brother. Come on, sister. Now I need encouragement. And you tell me, well, I don't know how to encourage you. I want to tell you what that's about. That's about destiny. It's about the fact that when God really wants to make you, he takes away all of your crutches. He takes away all your support system. He takes away all of your encouragement. I said, when God really wants to make you, you stand alone, treading the wine press alone. And a lot of you get angry at God and angry at people. You get, how come you're not there? How, how come you're not calling me? How come you're not praying for me? How come, you don't, how come you don't encourage me like I would encourage you? A lot of this has to do with destiny, friend. God, in essence, said they can't come with you. Yea, though I walk, not we walk, through the valley. See, when you start hitting the valley, it's an I thing. And why don't I fear any evil? Because thou, art, that means there's only two walking. You and God. So why are you upset when they can't come? Why are you upset when they don't lay hands on you and they don't give you an encouraging word? He already told you it was just going to be you and him. But he also told you, I won't leave you there. I'm going to anoint your head with oil until your cup starts running over. Whew. You're not staying there. It's just a transitional point to take you to the other side. You're not staying there. It's just a process to make you to what he designed you to be. You're not staying there, friend. It's just, amen, the way that God has designed that you must walk in order to come out on the other side. And that's why God said, I want to teach you how to have joy in the midst of the process. Because when the fire starts getting hot, you'll learn how to lift your hands and say, Lord, I love you. Because I know that this is the heart of the battle, is the greater the victory. It's the sweet of the victory. And I know you're about ready to do something great and powerful and wonderful with me. And when I don't see anybody else around me then I have to look under the hills from hence cometh my help because my help cometh from the Lord and God will make sure spouses can not help you mother can not help you dad can not help you best friend can not help you it's God and God alone somebody say God and God alone This week, God's going to let some of you out of your hell. He's going to lead you out. You've been laying there crying and bleeding. You've been holding your side while you've been trying to minister to others. He's going to lead you out. He's going to pour in medication into your spirit and cause you to understand he wasn't mom that turned their back on you he wasn't dad that turned their back on you you're blaming mom and dad the bible said mother and father forsake me
the Lord will take me and raise me up. Then God will take me. Destiny is going to start coming out. What you've always ordained me to be, what the devil has been trying to shut down, what he, the devil has been afraid of. God said, in this week, I'm going to heal you, set you on your feet, and raise you up like a mighty army. You've been laying like Ezekiel's graveyard, dry bones, disconnected, disjointed, confused and hurting without any help in sight. Yea, you've been dry, very dry. But there is a word from the Lord that's going to begin to speak to the four corners, that speaks to the illustration of his spear. The four corners represent the, the power, the dimension, the foundations of the earth. His, the wind represents his spirit. It means that God is going to bring forth the fullness of his power and begin to breathe putting bone to his bone not bone just to any bone bone to his bone God's gonna start joining you in the spirit bone to his, skin on your body stand you up and then breathe into you it's gonna reconstruct you the devil's gonna look in horror said now wait a minute we just threw our best shot at them and we have them laying dead we had them laying flat on their face and it was over and now they're not only back but they're stronger than what they were before how do you handle somebody like that how do you deal with somebody that you can kill lay in the ground proclaim them dead God comes by and resurrects them. Just when you said it's over and your enemy's laughing at you and we've got you just where we want you, here comes God going, get up, boy. Get up. Get up. I've got some more work for you to do. Going to get ready to empower you. Going to get ready to enable you. Get up because there's something else you got to do. There's something else. Destiny isn't done with you yet. You had to go into the pains of hell to resurrect with the power of the fulfillment of destiny. Would you lift your hands right now and give God some glory? Come on, come on, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. You're not staying there. Woo! Reko, resha, reko, reka. You're not staying here. Now listen, because I'm getting ready to open up this altar to, the, to those of you that are ready. And I want you to say this one last thing to you. There's some of you right now, you've been fighting fear, you've been fighting worry, unbelief. Some of you have been fighting low self-esteem. Some of you have been feeling like you're nothing, you're awkward, you're ugly. Some of you call yourselves fat cow. God said, make up in your mind tonight, you're not staying there. That I'm coming out through the power of the almighty resurrected savior and tonight i'm opening this altar to you and the altar is where you are too friend it doesn't just have to be the front area the altar is where you are but i want you to find a place of prayer some of you god needs to talk to you he needs to pour some medication into your spirit he needs to change the way you're thinking because although you're down friend you're not out you're not out. 
you're not out. Come on, this altar's open. Come if you want. Pray, come on. It's time to talk to God, friend. It's time to talk to God. God's not going to leave your soul in hell. Make up in your mind you're going to come for prayer for tomorrow. Come on. Those of you that want that deliverance, you need to be here at least an hour before service in prayer. Thou shall not leave my soul in hell. That's it. Come on, spread out all over this altar. The Holy Ghost is going to minister to you. Spread out all over this altar. We got plenty of room over here in the front. That's right. Sister, Sister Cobbs. Chef. Ready to pray with your pastor's wife. Just rub it into your hands, that's right. Yes, begin to pray with her. I want some of these young people to start praying together. Some of these young people just start praying together. Amen. Just start praying together. But some of these young people, God wants to bless you. God wants to bless some of you young people greatly right now. Just begin to pray together. Brothers with brothers, sisters to sisters, come on. Just begin to pray together, young people. Let God minister to you. God is going to bless you. You're going to make it, young people. You're going to make it. Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. Hallelujah. Come on, we're going to begin to pray right now. God's going to start touching people. Father, we pray for every person that's crying out to you. We believe you're right now to start pouring in oil and wine. We believe you're right now for lifting your people up. The burdens that are in their heart, the hurts, release. Let them know, God, you're not going to leave their soul in hell. You're not going to leave their soul in this difficulty. They're not staying here. Woo! Let them be encouraged. They shall not die, but they shall live. They shall live. They shall live. Whew. After the end of themselves, I pray right now, God, for impartation into their spirit that you're not going to leave their soul in hell. They're not staying here. They're not staying here. They're not staying here. Destroy yokes by the anointing. Minister, minister. Holy Ghost flow from hand to hand, from heart to heart, from mind to mind, from spirit. That's it. That's it. Lift your voice. Open your mouth. Come on. Woo! My God. Hey! Hey! You're not staying there. Woo! My God. Loose. Loose the pains of death. Loose God. Rock. 
Shaka, Rasha, Roko, Randalama, Sataya. Yes, yes, that's it. Come on, that's it. Keep talking to God. That's it. Woo!